I'm delighted to welcome Professor Mark Holderit, um, who is a sensory ecologist and bioacoustician with strong links to bio-inspired engineering. His research is in the fields of acoustic camouflage and biosonar navigation with a continuing passion for acoustic armed races and wildlife acoustic. Also, as an international consultant for an automotive industry, he helps develop ultrasonic vision technology. And today he will be talking to us about acoustic camouflage against bad biosonar. Thank you very much for joining us, Mark, and over to you. Thanks, Elisa. Thanks for this um, very nice introduction. Very kind and too kind. So what I'll do is I'll take over now um, in sharing my screen. Let's see whether that works. Um, I think, Elisa, you might need to stop sharing for me to be allowed to do that. <clears throat> okay, does that work, Elisa? Can you see the screen now? Okay, perfect. So I think we're all ready. Good. So, um, what am I? Well, what sort of biologist am I? I'm a bioacoustician, and I started out with insect bioacoustics. Then I got into uh, bat work for my PhD, and many years after, and now I've returned to um, insects again in the whole acoustics arms race between bats and insects. And today I'll be talking about a field that I think I'm working in, which is called acoustic camouflage in analogy to visual camouflage, where uh, organisms like this moth here have evolved certain strategy in defense against detection by bats that use their biosona to find their prey. So today you will see a lot of pictures of insects rather than bats, but I'll, I'll try and put in some bat work. If you're interested in some of the bat work that we are doing, just yesterday we published a, a paper in PLOS One with um, our PhD student, by our I mean co-supervised between myself and David Jacob at the University of Cape Town on echolocation and flight in the field of some horseshoe bats some really exciting work and Nikita has done some fantastic work here during her PhD. So please um, have a look and um, enjoy. I should also say, if you are interested in bioacoustics, there is a free for all initiative called the UK Acoustics Network. It has UK in its title, but you can join from wherever you are. And I lead something called a special interest group. And we have a, a strong team there that connects academics and industry and conservation workers that use acoustic monitoring, for example, but all sorts of bioacoustic researchers will find something interesting there. So feel free to check that out, register for free and become a, a, a member of this big network if you feel like it. Completely free, no obligations whatsoever. Okay, so this is what this is all about. Today's talk is all about how a moth avoids being eaten by a hungry bat. And there are a number of different angles to this. Many of you will be aware of the, the most exciting ones. I'll try and show you some, some novel and newer stories that have come out in the last two years or so. So if you're a gardener, or if you own an orchard or a fruit tree, that is a site that you might not want to see. Now that picture was taken in, in the Middle East, um, so sometimes you arrive and all the leaves are gone and there's this massive web which looks like a spider's web that covers the whole tree. Not a very good site. By the way, the trees survive, but in that year they have to have a second uh, spat of leaves and they, they won't produce much fruit. Um, if you go closer, you can see that these are not spiders. These are caterpillars, caterpillars of a moth that produce these communal nests. Um, and this is what the moth looks like. Um, it's a, a micro moth, it's white with black specks, so very brightly colored. And the, um, at night, of course, with such high numbers of caterpillars, there is very high numbers of moths once they fly. And of course, bats would be uh, all too happy to feast on this abundant insect supply. So how, if at all, can these moths protect themselves from bat predation? And we looked at these um, from a different angle, but I'll show you one video which really opened our eyes. 
So this is one of these moths in an infrared high-speed camera, and we tethered it on a, on a stick. And I hope you can hear this, but as the wind beats, it produces a series of clicks, and these are ultrasonic clicks. I will slow them down so we can hear them. And you can hear that the clicks are produced whenever the wing is rotating. So that's interesting. These moths are completely deaf, they have no ears, but whenever they fly, they constantly produce these ultrasonic clicks. And that intrigued us. So first of all, we wanted to find out how they do this, where the clicks are coming from. And for that, we did some um, analysis on their wings. And this is where we found the sound producing structure. So it's a, it's a clear area at the base of the hind wing. You can see it here, and it has uh, an area where there's simply no scales. Here, that's a light microscope on the left. And it also has a striated area here. And the way this works is that when the wing rotates, it bends and folds. There's actually one standard fold, which is present in all insect wings um, that goes right through the center of the cell. So when the wing folds and bends during the rotation of the wing beat cycle, these individual striations here, numbered one to 11, they buckle through. It's like a bistable system. When you buckle something, it produces a click. And each of these striations buckles in turn, and that creates one of these click series that we heard before. And then in the downstroke, in the reverse direction, it unbuckles again. So this is how they produce these, these click trains and how they produce two of these click trains per wing beat cycle. The clear area just above the striations is what we call the window. And this is what uh, we could call an amplifier. It helps to make the sound uh, louder. And there is no scales there because scales would hamper that amplification. So it's a really cool mechanism, um, a very um, neat and unknown mechanism that we've only published uh, very recently, discovered very recently. Um, but once you've discovered it, uh, you start uh, and look for it everywhere. And all of a sudden, we find it has evolved multiple times independently in, in Microlepidoptera. And not just in this region in the hind wing, we have found four different regions in which such click producing structures have evolved. And they are always associated to one of these folding lines. You can see the dashed red lines. These are standard folding lines in an insect wing. So evolution has just chosen something that happens for flight anyway, that's folding off the wing. And then it just evolved a click producing structure in that region. So it gets the click production basically for free as a byproduct of flight. It's wonderful, it's powerful. Now, how does it help the survivability of these tiny insects? And now you have to think about something that we have known for some time, and that is the sound production of the tiger moth. So we know that tiger moths do have ears, and when they hear an approaching bat, they respond by sending an ultrasonic click burst. Um, there is, for example, this genus Cygnia. And now I'm going to play you a sound recording of this tiger moth followed by this Iponomuta, that's the genus of the moth that we have just been studying. So just bear with me and listen to this and just notice how similar these sounds are. That's the tiger moth. And that was the Iponomuta moth. So there are some remarkable similarities in the patterning, in the frequency, in the rhythm. And because of that, we call them um, acoustic mimics. So one mimics the other. We don't really know which one mimics whom, but what we do know is that both of them, by this mimicking, achieve something that's called aposematism. It's a warning sound. Aposematic coloration is what bees and wasps have, the, the, the black and yellow stripes, which warn potential predators. That's the acoustic equivalent. So what do they warn the bat as a predator uh, from? Um, and that is that both of these taxa produce uh, chemicals that bats find unpleasant or even poisonous. So they not only copy each other in their acoustic signal, they also um, help each other by defending each other mutually. So that's a specific kind of mimicry that's called Mullerian mimicry, where all the mimics together 
uh, work together to educate the population of predators. It's a beautiful example. And now what I find even more remarkable is the structural convergence we have. So this is on the top, the what we now call an aeroelastic ring, timbal. Timbal is a sound producing structure. You've seen that before. And below that, it's a close up with a similar scale of the sound producing structure of the tiger moth. But the tiger moth doesn't have it in its wing. They have it in the body. There is actually a, a tracheal air sac behind this. There's a muscle attached right here, which then contracts and that buckles the structure in. So while the origin, the evolutionary origin of these structures is completely different, different body parts, different um, sound amplification, different actuation, the structure that is evolved looks extremely similar. So these striations with a clear window next to it. So there's, this is a beautiful example of structural convergence. Okay, so, so that's almost the full story, but I've got one more exciting angle for it. Now, if, if you're a, a, a moth, the best thing you, that can happen to you is that you're not even detected by a bat. Now, if you are, whenever you're in flight, producing very powerful sounds, that sounds like it's very counter-induced. So you don't want to be detectable by the sounds, your flight noises, because bats are very good at picking them up. So the problem might be that you're more detectable. And if the, the bat is not yet educated, it doesn't know that it shouldn't eat you, you will lose your life. You will, you will invest in the education of the bat population, but still you're dead. So, is there potentially a risk to producing sound? And how do you respond to this? And here in the top panel here, I've got the answer to that. So what we have is in these green dots, these are the amplitudes of the clicks measured from different directions and translated into over what distance a standard bat would hear these clicks. Okay, so for example, to the rear, click would be detectable about five meters far away. To the front, it would be six meters. To the side, it would be even more like just below eight meters. Um, and the solid line here is an echo measurement of this species. And again, we calculate what the detection range of your standard bat would be for the echoes of this moth. And what we find is that the clicks are almost exactly detectable over the same distance that the bat would detect the moth by biosonar anyway. So yes, you're putting additional information out there, but you make it such that, that you're not detectable by the sound over greater distances than you're detectable by the echo. So it's, it's, it's like perfectly adjusted spatially um, to um, maximize your survivability. So I'm, I'm super excited by that whole system. There is a lot of rich stuff going on. Many of these species are in Africa. I collaborate with a, a, a lovely man called uh, David Agassiz, who spends a lot of time traveling the continent and finding more of these. I'm always interested in getting recordings of some microlepidoptera. Um, and so we are, we are building a recording database for some of these wing beat generated sounds. So if you if you like to go to bat caves, um, point your bat detectors at the dung heaps underneath the bats, because this is where, where several of these species live. And if you find one, catch it and please let me know. We are very excited by any discoveries that way. Okay, so that was, that was the first story. It is an acoustic defense, but I had promised to talk to you about acoustic camouflage. Now here, that's another tropical bat species, a uh, moth species. And I've put it there because it just is so beautifully fluffy and furry. And you can see so much detail on the scales on there. And what we were intrigued by is whether these furry hairs on the body actually help protect the moth against detection by bat at location. So how would that work? Well, the sound enters the fur and then it is absorbed in the fur like in a normal sound absorber. So in order to do this, we developed a method called acoustic tomography. So we, we built an artificial bat, that's a loudspeaker and a microphone, and then we take an echo of 
uh, a moth specimen in the center or a butterfly specimen, as in this case. And then we repeat this from many different directions by controlling two turntables. And we can have thousands, tens of thousands of echoes. And then we put them into some very smart math algorithm, which creates a three-dimensional model of the object painted by sound. And that tells us which body part gives us how much sound and at what frequency. And just as an example on the right here, I've shown you this is, this is the photographic image. And on the right, that's the acoustic image. This is what the echo image of this butterfly would look like. You can see the antenna, you can see individual veins. So it's, it's very clear that this is the same organism. And that's a very powerful tool. I'm not aware that anybody else, any lab anywhere else has this functionality and we keep discovering exciting stuff. So how did we use it? We used our very furry moth and we shaved it. So I've got one of the world experts in moth shaving. And then we took an acoustic tomography. That's one way to plot it. That's another one which mirrors more closely how mammals hear echoes. And what you see is that an intact moth, you can't really see the body. And that's where you don't want that to strike. So suppressing the echo there is a good thing. Now, once we shave it, see how the echo intensity increases. All the rest is pretty much the same, but all of a sudden the body becomes the strongest target. So without the fur, the bat would, detect, would attack the body. So that is a clear evidence that there is some protection, some sound absorption going on. We've done this a bit more systematically. We compared two moths with two butterflies, and we compared the intact in green with the completely bald in red. And here there's a measure that's called the relative target strength. And you can see that the target strength increases when you shave, and that's the acoustic effect of the scales. But the lower row of panels really is what you should be looking at. This is where we then, again, taking the sonar equation, work out um, the size or the, the, the change in what we call the detectability bubble. So think about the moth and then there's a bat and we move the bat systematically around in the whole space and we calculate from which positions the echo of this moth would be detectable and from which it wouldn't. And all the positions that are inside the bubble make up a certain volume. And now we repeat this with and without scales and calculate the size change for every frequency that is brought forward by the presence of the fur. And the yellow curve tells us that simply by putting fur on the body, this moth gains 40% in protection. So it, the, the detectability volume drops by 40%. And that's massive tiny investment, just a bit of fur on the body, massive protection. So that is beautiful. And this other moth species has a similar value, slightly lower. Looking at the butterflies, very little protection. In some cases, the presence of the scale actually makes the, scale, the body more detectable. So the fur doesn't really do any good. If anything, it makes things worse. So that's that's an interesting observation. How, how does the fur do this? So let's have a look at the structure. There are some obvious structural differences between moths on the left and butterflies on the right. You can see that these are all done to the same scale. You can see that there is more hair. There's a denser layer of hair in the moth compared to the butterflies. And if you look at the cuticle that carries all these hairs. You can see these are the insertion points. So in the moth, they're about as densely packed as you can imagine they are. So you couldn't put any more hairs there. But in the butterflies, you see there's a lot of empty space there. And if you look closely, you can see that there is even two different sizes of insertion points. The thin ones are for hairs. These are the ones that absorb sound. The thicker ones are for these well, spatulate scales, which are more like the scales that you find on butterfly wings, and they don't have the function that we want. So it's clear that there is a clear structural difference between the sound absorbing moth fur and the non sound absorbing butterfly fur. Here is a, a high resolution scan of a whole moth body. This is not the face of a scary uh, clown. Um, this really is a cross section through the um, 
thorax of a moth, and in false color, you can see the individual hairs. We measured some structural parameters, and then we compared them to what architectural acousticians that build our houses and make sure that they are good noise-free environments used to make our living spaces uh, less noisy. So they use something called fibrous sound absorbers material. And if you compare a close-up of this to the structure we have here, this is clearly a fibrous porous absorber. And then if you look closer, some other sound absorbers we use in technology are porous absorbers that have these cellular structures. Now, if you look at a single hair, you can see that inside that it has this porous structure as well. So evolution has found the same tricks that we have found independently to achieve a similar goal. Now, the important bit there is that any sound absorber will only be as good as the lowest frequency it has to absorb. Let me explain. So it, if the sound is too low to be absorbed, that is because the absorber is not thick enough. As a general rule of thumb, you have to have a sound absorber that's about one tenth of the wavelength of the sound you want to absorb. Okay, that sounds like Okay, but what does it really translate to? If you think about human communication, that's the noise in our offices, then you would need to think about wavelengths that are several meters long. And that explains why well, some of the sound absorbers in our offices and homes are rather bulky. So they are well, often 20, 25 centimeters thick. And that's the, what they have to be. That's a compromise simply by the physical um, constraints imposed on these sound absorbers. Okay, so we've published this in Royal Society Interface and it's one of their most read papers ever. It's free, so if you want to learn more about it, just uh, dive in and then see how we did all this. So let's go back to our, our little moth here. So now we've discovered that the fur on the body is super sound absorbing and it protects it from detection by bats. And you can see how the fur stretches out onto the wings to a certain region. But then if you look further, the scaling pattern is still there, but it looks very different. It's no longer furry. It looks like roof tiles of different colors. This is the, the, the fine dust that comes off when you touch a moth or a butterfly. These are the scales that break off. Now, obviously it would help if you had fur there, but imagine uh, a moth having to fly with several millimeters of fur on either side of their wing. That wouldn't work aerodynamically. But doesn't that mean that the whole mumbo jumbo about protecting yourself from detection with this fur is completely pointless if then your wings are unprotected? In other words, any protection is only as good as its weakest link. And if we are not protecting the wings, the bats would simply attack the wing echo and not the body echo and the moth is still lost and detected. So it looks like we have found an amazing adaptation, the fur absorption, but actually it doesn't help the moth at all. Or does it? So could it be that these tiny scales, these much thinner layers of scales on the wing, give the moth something that does acoustically something similar to what this very thick fur does. So look at these scales. They look very different to the fur that we've seen. It look like fingered structures that overlap and create this overlapping, somewhat chaotic, but highly structured uh, canopy of scales. And most importantly, if moths have evolved this, could we try and work out how they did it and that would help us to produce thinner and better sound absorbers for our homes and offices. Okay, so let's see what we can learn. So we've, we've used a technology called um, sound field measurements by laser. So we shoot a laser through air and that then shows us where the sound is propagating. And here I've clamped a bit of wing membrane and it sticks out up to about here. And when I play this, you can see a, a sound wavefront coming in. And now watch what happens when it interacts with the, with the wing membrane. Interesting stuff going on. So we can see that some sound goes through, some sound is reflected, but a lot of it is actually absorbed 
in that very thin layer of wing membrane. So we went about this a bit more systematically and we used our tomograph again. And what we did is we, we measured a wing sample, then we shaved it and measured it again. And the difference between the two things tells us the acoustic effect of the scales. Here you can see some examples of uh, a moth species and here of a butterfly species. You can see that there are uh, also similar differences between the scaling on the wings, similar to what we've seen on the bodies. Much more regular on the butterfly than on the um, moth and also much more hair-like on the moth and spatulate on the butterfly. Now here on the right, you can see the acoustic effect of the scales. So this is the effect of having scales on your wing. And a value above zero here means the scales absorb sound. And the values below zero here mean that the scales reflect more sound. Blue are all the butterflies we measured. And what you can see is that adding scales to a wing, if you're a butterfly, makes you more detectable to a bat. But that doesn't matter because you're only active when the bats are not. But scales are not sound absorptive. A non-modified scale is actually sound reflective. But then you change it into this structure when you become a moth. And all of a sudden, you flip over to the other side and you get sound absorption values up to 73% of all the acoustic energy being absorbed. Now, this down here, the wing thickness to wavelengths, you can keep this as a frequency axis with low frequencies on the left and high frequencies on the right. But remember what I've told you about the, the sound absorber needing to be one tenth of the wavelength to work. Now here, that's this um, well you hear. So the body fur sits at this one tenth parameter. But now look what's happening on the wing. The wing stays strong up to one hundredth of the wavelength. And it doesn't look like it's going to drop off. We just stop measuring here. So what we have is on the wing, we've got a sound absorber that's as efficient as the body fur in the acoustic absorption, but it's only a tenth of the thickness. So it's 10 times more efficient than anything that we use at the moment. So the, the moths really have discovered something quite remarkable that we do not replicate yet for our homes and offices. And what they have discovered is a deep sub wavelength, one over 100, and broadband sound absorber. So that's the trick. It needs to absorb all the frequencies that the bats would use to be uh, effective. So super exciting from the acoustics perspective. Let's try and understand how this works. And for that, we chose one individual scale and studied it to an incredible level of detail and it revealed its secret. So this scale that we have here that we imaged with the nano CT is about a third of a millimeter long and you can see some nanostructure there. And on the right, you can see uh, you're zooming through the central region and you can see that there's ridges and cross ribs and the top layer and the bottom layer. So it's a, it's a complex nanostructured uh, structure that these moths have evolved. And most moth scales look very much like that, but butterfly scales have some systematic differences to that design, which I don't have the time to go into detail about. But keep in mind, this is a double perforated nanostructure that we have. Now, what does that tell us? Um, well, let's look at something that we haven't looked at before, and that is movement of these scales when they are hit by sound. So let's interpret a scale like a resonator. Resonance, keep in mind, resonance is like when you've got a, a kid on, a, on a, a swing, you have to push it at the right frequency for it to get a higher and higher amplitude. If you push it at the wrong frequency, you will stop it. So that's a resonant phenomenon. The same is true with these scales. So when you hit them with sound, at certain frequencies, they'll have large vibration amplitudes, at others, they won't. And what we found at this one single scale here, we scanned the central area with a laser Doppler scanner, and we found three different resonances, and they correspond to three different directions of movement of the scale. So one is the, well, one of the three ways in which you would wave your hand. So it's an upward, downward, a left, right, or a rotation movement. And these are the three frequencies. And because we knew the scale so well, we 
in addition to the measurement, we tried to model it and we could recreate the same three resonance modes and we could recreate them at exactly, well, it's, it's stunningly close, um, the frequencies that we have measured. So now we know, and that was published in PNAS in 2018, now we know that these things resonate. And what does resonance mean? It means that the acoustic energy is turned into motion energy in the scale. And the scale itself has internal friction. So in the end, this motion energy will be turned into um, heat. So what we have here is a system that absorbs three different frequencies, 27, 90, and 150. Um, and if you put that into perspective with a, a, a standard Batek location core, that's the frequency range that we know bats use, but most of them are in this low frequency range. You can see that these resonances match the, the frequency range that bats use rather well. So that's great, uh, but it's only three out of the many, many frequencies that these scales, um, uh, that the bats produce. So what happens at the other frequencies? Well, the trick is, um, there's another scale that's tuned to another frequency right next to it. And over the whole wing, there is scales tuned to all the frequencies together. And then each scale absorbs its own frequency and together they absorb everything. That's a, a 3D model of such a bit of wing. And if we then measure their resonances in a moth, here you can see the bat echolocation frequency range. You can see that there is a nice and even distribution of all the resonances over all the frequencies. And that's true for these two examples. If we look at a butterfly, you can see that most of the scales are very similar and have the same resonance frequencies, while others are far less frequent. So that's the first evidence. Then we looked at the dimensions of the scales and we confirmed that, yes, indeed, the shape and size of the scales determines their resonances. And because butterflies are much more um, similar looking in their scale architecture, they have the same resonances, while these diverse scales on the moth provide these broad sets of resonances which absorb all the frequencies that are there. Beautiful, so we've got that. Now, that doesn't even end there. So if we now try and understand how these individual scales interact, um, that's an interesting phenomenon because if you've got a single scale for one frequency, and you only have it at one spot on the membrane, um, a large section of the wing wouldn't absorb at that frequency. So it might be locally protecting, but not globally protecting the whole wing. So what we looked at is what happens when we have several of these scales together? Do they interact? Do they cooperate? And that's exactly what we found. So we modeled a four by four system of frequencies tuned from 30 to 45 kilohertz. Each of them absorbs one frequency band. You can see it's best at this frequency and it gets increasingly poorer to higher or lower frequencies. These are the absorption peaks in different colors. But if we use the same number of scales, but rather than having all of them tuned to the same frequency, we tune them to this uh, randomized frequency pattern, you get the black curve. And what I want you to compare is the area under the curve of any of the colored curves to the area under the curve of this thicker black line. And not just does it have a higher absolute value, no, there's a much higher area under the curve. So that means the total performance of this structure is more than the sum of its constituting parts. That's what we call an emergent property. And that's the telltale sign of a really exotic class of materials. It's the telltale sign of a metamaterial. Metamaterials do exactly that. They have emergent properties. So we have found in this moth the first known acoustic metamaterial found in science. Now, interestingly, I'm just giving you this talk from Lovely Sorry at a conference on metamaterials where I'm talking about this discovery. Um, Interestingly, there is one other class of natural metamaterials that we know of, and these are creating structural colors in, believe it or not, Lepidoptera and butterflies, and it's again created by the scales. So for some reason, the scales of Lepidoptera have a, a knack for becoming metamaterials. For the Lepidoptera butterflies, 
they produce structural color, these metallic colors that you can see. For the moth, they produce sound absorbing, super thin layers. Um, super exciting stuff. And I think it must have to do with the level of control that the Lepidoptera have over the design of these scales. Again, something published rather um, highly and with a really good uh, Twitter following. So we have discovered the first acoustic metamaterial. Now, I've talked about homes and offices a lot. So what are we doing about it? So now we understand how this works. We use something called direct write lithography. It's basically what you use to produce computer chips, but we use it to print elastic plastic onto a silicon wafer. And then we create something that looks a bit like a highly simplified moth scale. And when we turn that into a little sample um, and we do our acoustic tomography, that's a cross section. This is a, a solid and that's the same region coated with a tiny bit of sound absorbing scales. And you can see how in the tomography, you can see the central bit suppressed. That's a top down view. And if you do that on a spectral domain, you can see that green arrow here shows us that there is a big suppression at the frequency at which these scales, that cell type one, resonate. And if we do the math, the absorber is only 60 micrometers thick. So that's less than a tenth of a millimeter, a fifteenth of a millimeter. And that absorbs about 90% of the sound. And it's only a hundred and tenth of the wavelengths in thickness. So this is exactly what we want to achieve. This is what we want to implement. So our latest prototypes, that's a picture from two days ago, they look like this. It's where we've got larger areas, we've scaled it into the audible range. And when we look at that, this is the absorption that we get. So we get broadband absorption in the audible range, which is in the hertz rather than the kilohertz. And the blue curve is our prototype. The gray curve is a, a standard technical sound absorber form. And this is only our third prototype. So we've got many months to go to optimize this. So we are getting closer to developing um, this fantastic sound absorber wallpaper. Okay, to, to, to finish, I'll, I'll show you some more photos of moths and talk a bit more about acoustic camouflage. So what we have here is two different moths in comparison. One of them is a lunar moth on the green, on the left, the green one, and they have these really odd protuberances at the tip of their hind wing. And behavioral studies with bats show that these are false targets. So they produce a lot of ultrasound, that's the theory, and that lures the bat away from the body towards this part. And if the bat strikes there, it either breaks off or it flicks out of the way, but in any way, um, the, the moth is protected. And what we discovered with a, an undergrad student um, just over a year ago is that some other moths in the same family have these weird structures at their wingtips. Looks like ripples or folds. And we were interested whether this also could be creating strong echoes to attract the bats to this part of the body. Again, far removed from the body um, towards the wingtip. Um, and again, now you can see an acoustic again. And here you can see that there is a very strong echo coming off exactly the region where you see these ripples. And when you look closely, we can understand why the echoes are so strong. So modis modifications create a strong effect. First of all, we've got these ripples. In a cross section, they are almost perfectly sinusoidal. And that is a structure that we know already. This is what we call a hemispheric retroreflector. So how does that work? So let's, let's imagine the sound coming from the top. It's then reflected from the side, goes over there, hits the other side, and then comes back. So that means you've got a, a, a double reflection, which gives a strong echo from many different directions. So simply by making this an undulating wave, you're boosting your echo intensity. And the same double reflection happens at corner reflectors, where you've got two parts of the wing that meet at 90 degree angle. And we find that these folds here, that you can see the wing tip, they all have 90 degree angles, which again means that they are sending back sound into the direction that the sound came from. 
So we've got two different kinds of retroreflectors that evolution has given these uh, wingtips, which turn them into a very strong um, false target acoustic decoy. And that's a paper that we published about half a year ago in current biology. Um, and now to just close the loop, these decoys, like in this fantastic Madagascar moon moth, they have scales on them. And microscopically, the scales on the wing and on the wing tip, on these streamers, look identical. But when you compare their acoustic effect, you can see there is a forewing and a hindwing. They have a certain target strength, which is very similar in blue and red here. But the tail has a much stronger echo. And that is true in this species here. And that's also true in this species for certain frequency bands. And that means that even though it looks the same, that same moth specimen has sound absorbing scales on the wings. That's the standard moth design, but it has strongly sound reflecting scales on the wingtip like a butterfly would. So even within a single individual, evolution has managed to adjust these scales to the local needs, produce a weak echo to protect yourself, or to produce a strong echo to direct the bat away from the body. So next time you see an insect, in particular a moth, I'd like you to think acoustic camouflage, um, because it had certainly opened my eyes to this fascinating field. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that. It was just amazing and just incredible what moths can do basically to bait predation. Uh, and it was just mind blowing for me, I guess. I love bats and I love moths, but these um, just adaptations that they've evolved is just incredible to see. Um, fantastic work that you and your team are doing in terms of. Uh, the videos that you showed us and the recordings uh, to just really understand those processes uh, better. It's just, uh, yeah, amazing. Um, let me see if we have any questions in the chat. Um, some good comments. Um, I'll start with um, yeah, some comments saying no idea uh, of the complexity of the moth structure, let alone that they could make noises. Um, yeah. Um, so I had a question about, so you presented some examples about uh, individual moth species that you did really closely. Um, how representative do you think they are of what, obviously moths are such a diverse taxonomic group, um, is that, is this a really consistent adaptations or you think it's particular groups of moths that have evolved um, to the bats a bit better than others? So, as you said, there is, there's literally tens of thousands of different moth species out there. Um, Bristol, where we live in the UK, has 1300 moth species just in the woods surrounding it, which is stunning. So. No, me, no way we could have measured even a meaningful fraction of those. But those that we do have measured all have some sort of degree of protection. Well, we, we all know that many insects have ears and fly away when they hear an approaching bat. So they don't really need this protection, that, which is a passive protection. So maybe I should stress that all the species I've talked about today are deaf, so they can't fly away. But we find maybe not that strong, but we find very strongly protected eared moths as well um, as in the non-eared deaf moth. So my starting point is I yet have to see a single moth that doesn't have at least some sound absorptive functionality in their wings. So I, I think it's a bit curious. I think when you when you start looking at a moth and how fluffy they are, yes, I'm sure there's a thermoregulation aspect to it, but I think a lot of the fluff is really there in defense against bats. Yeah, and it makes them look even more beautiful. So <laughs> that's an additional. 
know a bit of it. Um, there's a question uh, about how long have you have you been working on this research? Okay, so um, as you can imagine, I've been a, a lifelong bioacoustician. So the whole bat insect coevolution was really what I was doing. But I started working on the whole moth scale story uh, six years ago. So this is now we are just coming to the end of the second big grant, three year grant that we had, which will end at the end of September. So, and there is, there is even more stuff. I just have a fantastic team that work with me on this, uh, a team of engineers and material scientists and prototypers and modelers that do all the exciting stuff. I only come up with the, with the weird ideas and then they have to make it happen. So I couldn't do anything without the fantastic team members I have. Yeah. Um, and there's another question, which maybe it's a whole other webinar <laughs> that you could give about, is um, how do bats combat these adaptations back? Okay, so that is actually a, a very cool story. Uh, story, no, a cool question. I don't know. And I frankly don't know whether there is a trick that bats could use to break through this defense. Because if you don't send an echo, the bat can't detect the echo. There is no, no processing, no increase in sensitivity that would take away that gain. The only thing a bat could do, it might find that these protection, these absorbers work at certain frequencies better than at others. And then the bat could tune into the frequency bands where the protection isn't as strong and therefore gain a partial benefit. But as I've shown you, these, these sound absorbers are stunningly broadband. So evolution has really equipped these moths with this in acoustic invisibility cloak. So I guess it's just the fact that they're not perfect. So there will be some moths that the bats will be detecting. But this is, uh, in, in common lingo, I think this is the killer application. Um, another question, could moths be using these acoustic skills to read their environment in addition to avoiding bats? Ah, so now you're talking about um, sensing. Well, I've told you this is a metamaterial huh? and metamaterial scientists, most of them are more interested in sensing than in what I'm doing in sound absorbing. So metamaterials are indeed um, fantastically powerful if you implement them in sensors. So think about your, your smartphone screens. They are all patterned with nano lenses, which are all the metamaterials and the, the processes that we use to produce our TV screens are all enabled by metamaterial technology. Now, whether bats could use metamaterials to sense, I'm not sure. Keep in mind that the wings, they are dead tissue. So the scales themselves have no nerve cells that innovate them, they have no actuators. So I think it will be hard for an organism to turn this metamaterial into a sensor metamaterial, but hell, evolution has surprised us so many times. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them had found a way to make it happen. Lots more to learn, I guess. Um, another question, um, what works best against the moth hair? Frequency modulated calls or constant frequency calls? <laughs> okay, so I think that the question is related to what we just said, it's the bandwidth. So let's assume that this, this fur um, is broadband. It absorbs all the frequencies that the bat produces in the same degree. So by a certain number of decibels. So that means it shouldn't make a difference whether you use a single frequency like constant frequency bats would do or a sweeping frequency. But I don't think it's that simple. If it's just a detection task, putting more energy into a single frequency, which means that all the echo energy ends up at the same spot on your inner ear cochlea, increases your likelihood of detecting it. So for a detection task, a constant frequency call would always be better. Uh, and that's irrespective of whether the, the moth has a furry cloak or not. But then once you're close and you want to know where to attack, you probably still want to have a broadband call um, that allows you to localize the moth. So I think that the same general rules that you always apply for echolocation apply to this. It's just that 
the, the overall information you have to work with is much reduced by the fur. Hope this, this was useful. Yeah, um, great. Um, and I think a final question. Um, could you just explain again uh, the definition of meta material, mm. um, which I guess have to do with emergent properties? Okay, so uh, whoever asked that question, I should invite you here. So we've got 120 meta material scientists, and we cannot. And not for a lack of trying, we cannot agree on a definition. And that's been a heated discussion that's been raging for two years now, uh, for two days now. So, but the, uh, my definition, which I think is the correct one, obviously, um, my definition is that a metamaterial is a material that is a composite, which consists uh, of sub elements. Some people call these the atoms or the sub elements, resonators, in my case, scales. And you arrange them in a fancy way such that they interact with each other. And that interaction creates new properties, so-called emergent properties, that go beyond the sum of the contributions of the individual constituting parts. So really this functional boost where the interaction creates something that you couldn't have before. And it's more than the sum of the parts. That's what defines a metamaterial. That's about as good as I can explain that at the moment. <laughs> Sounds like a good definition to me, but yeah, there's a um, challenge, I guess, if you have lots more discussion between um, other people with different ideas. Um, great. So I think we'll just bring this to a close. Uh, I'll just like to thank you again uh, for telling us such brilliant stories uh, about acoustic defense, acoustic camouflage, uh, acoustic decoys. Uh, it's just been uh, really uh, interesting and lots to learn. Uh, and yeah, uh, good luck with um, continuing your research because um, it's lots more questions to explore. <clears throat> Fantastic. Well, thank you. You've been too kind, Elisa. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And thanks for all the kind comments and the nice questions. Yeah, I was just going to say there's lots of thanks and very nice comments in the chat. So uh, please have a look if you can. Uh, and thanks very much again. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and yeah, please continue coming to our webinars uh, uh, on Wednesdays and uh, once a month. Thanks very much and have a great rest of your days. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye, thank you.